estimate the same thing. So this purple dot here shows what you would get if you took 10 random eyewall signs in the simulation and found the maximum from them. And then you repeat that many times to get the expected value of that distribution. And so if you do that in the simulation, which is about 145, 150 knot storm, you get a value of about 100 meters per second, which is very similar to the observed estimate. If you increase the sampling in the simulation to 100 sons instead of uh, 10 sons, you get this red dot here. So you're increasing the peak winds that you expect to sample. And then it starts getting higher than the observed distribution. But 100 sons is many more sons than we actually have um, in an intense tropical cyclone. So that, that's showing sampling that we wouldn't expect to get. So this is further evidence that um, as far as we can tell, the uh, simulation is similar to the observations in terms of what the strongest winds we could expect to sample for a given intensity. So um, I, I also I wanted to look at uh, more detail about uh, what is the structure of the features that we're actually sampling. Um, and in the simulation, we can take a look at that. Um, so this is an example from the, a coarser simulation from a 125 meter rich spacing simulation um, showing uh, the eyewall structure. This is the lowest kilometer and a half. So we're not looking at the whole storm, we're just looking down at low levels. Mm -hmm. And this uh, low, lower level here, this is uh, the cross section of horizontal wind speed um, at um, 10 meters height. And you can see um, the 90 meter per second wind gusts here all around it. Um, and then the upper cross section here is wind speed at one and a half kilometer side. Um, the, the silver surfaces here are um, uh, very strong vorticity isosurfaces. Um, so 0.18 per second vorticity. So associated with each of these wind uh, speed maxima, um, just inside of it are these very intense uh, uh, towers of vertical vorticity. Um, and then associated with the vorticity features are these extreme updrafts. Um, these uh, magenta surfaces, these are 20 meter per second updrafts. And, and we can see how this evolves. So this is a two minutes or no, I think 10 minutes of data um, every three seconds. Um, and if you pick, a, pick your favorite wind gust to follow at the surface, um, you can see that we can track it in time for, for several minutes um, around the eye wall. You can track some of them halfway around the eye wall. And for each of the wind maxima, there's a vorticity maximum just inwards of it that, that um, um, maintains this relationship in time. Um, and similarly for the, the updrafts. So I think these are, um, these are the vortices that exist on the eye eye wall interface that are responsible for these wind gusts. Um, and in this case, we're not really fully resolving it because it's 125 meters, but this is just, I believe, like a larger scale representation of what is actually there. So how high the vorticity extends? So, um, so these are actually very shallow. shallow. Um, and um, you can see that here, I think, actually. This is, um, this is um, an example in a one by one by one kilometer cube zoomed in on an individual updraft. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's purple is 12 meter per second updraft. And the green isosurface is 0.15 per second vorticity. Um, so this is this structure here is um, uh, confined to the lowest kilometer, um, and you can you can sort of see that by if you the the lower so the lower surface here this cross section is um, the perturbation tangential wind speed so subtracting the azimuthal mean um, so associated with this very strong vortex here you have um, I should point out that the flow here where the, the flow of the hurricane, the tangential flow, is going approximately from right to left. And so into the screen, it's sort of outwards, away from the, the, the center. And so associated with this, this rotation from this vortex, you're getting a positive perturbation of tangential wind just outside of the vortex. So that's 10 to 20 to 30 meter per second positive perturbation flow. And then on the inside of the vortex, you get this negative flow because now 
um, you're, you're coming around against the, against the mean flow. Um, but at, at, at a one kilometer height, there's a very little signature of this, these perturbations, um, and, and the flow is much smoother. So you tend to just get this confined to, to the lowest levels, and these features are relatively shallow. Um, I'm not sure if I have a movie. I might have a movie and a couple slides of it, which, which shows that this structure sh stays shallow. So um, existing only in the boundary layer? Not only in the boundary layer, but I think it's most pronounced in the boundary layer. If you looked at an individual feature at a kilometer, you could find that there too. But that structure would be would be also shallow. It wouldn't it wouldn't continue downwards, so it'll be isolated. They're they're kind of they appear to be maybe 500 meters deep or so. But it, it's not going to exist at all level. Like you wouldn't find this. I don't think you'll find this if you go up to five kilometers, for example. Okay. Um, yeah. So this this shows how how in the simulation there's a real tight relationship between. Um, spatially between the vorticity, the green, and the updraft, the magenta here, um, nearly co-located, and that vorticity is inducing a perturbation flow, um, which which gives you enhanced tangential winds just outside of the updraft. And and this is showing um, this is from the 30, 31 meter uh, grid spacing simulation. Um, we can track the updrafts um, by, by finding the peak vertical velocity and uh, taking a threshold contour of vertical velocity and finding it at each consecutive time and, and tracking it. And so these black curves show the track of the of updrafts at 200 meters height um, at, a, at a specific time that I chose. And uh, the blue line is, is a specific updraft that um, um, I believe the strongest updraft at this time that I chose to focus on, and this, this plot on the right here is a horizontal cross-section of vertical velocity at 200 meters height, showing a, a 45 meter per second updraft, so incredibly strong. Um, and then just upstream of it is a, is a 10 to 15 meter per second downdraft. And the white contour here is a strong vertical vorticity, so it's nearly co-located with the updraft. And uh, it'll be clear in the in the movie to follow, but this there's a little red contour here, and that's 100 meter per second horizontal wind speed, just outside of the radially outward of the of the updraft. So that's <coughs> consistent with that um, 3D structure I showed you a moment ago. So if we follow this updraft in time uh, for a couple minutes, we can track it. Uh, it evolves rapidly. Um, it'll fluctuate from 20 to 45 meters per second over a period of only 10 to 20 seconds, so very strong accelerations. Mm -hmm. um, and the wind speed evolves very rapidly too. Um, but for a, a long period of time, for several minutes, um, you'll have wind speeds, the red, greater than 100 meters per second that is consistently associated with the same updraft. And the vorticity in white is, is associated with this updraft as well. Um, and then finally, um, you see a downdraft forming upstream of the updraft here that becomes very strong. Uh, is this type of vorticity is different from tornado? Um, I think that's an interesting question. I think it shares something in common with tornado dynamics. Mm -hmm. And you might be able to think about these as, as sort of, uh, of tornado-like structures within mm -hmm. the hurricane. Um, I, I think more work needs to be done to look at that, but yeah, I think I think there's some similarities with with, with tornadoes. Um, the difference from most tornadoes here is that um, most of the wind is still from the mean, um, so those these perturbations of the tangential wind are on the order of 20 to maybe 40 meters per second, which is strong, but the mean wind is already 80 to 90 meters per second here, so you have this mean vortex that's strong, and then small, maybe tornado-like perturbations on top of it. Um, so this shows the horizontal cross-section of, of um, vertical velocity on the left, horizontal wind speed in the center, and vertical vorticity on the right. Um, the top plot is uh, at the time of, of peak um, horizontal wind speed, 
and the bottom plot says there's the time of peak vertical wind speed, peak updraft. Um, and, and these are all um, uh, one by one kilometer boxes. So the scale of these features is on the order of 500 meters. Um, and so uh, looking at the, the top plot, uh, uh, this is the time of peak wind speed. So you have a, actually a 118 meter per second wind gust here, um, which is just radially outward. So this, this black dashed line shows kind of the circle of the eye wall, and we're just zoomed in on a small part. So this is in the southeast eye wall. So radially outward is uh, towards the lower right of the plot. So the wind gust is maximized uh, just outside of the peak updraft uh, here. And that all these plots are centered on the peak updraft. And, um, and the updraft is nearly co-located with the vorticity feature. Um, and uh, at this time, the updraft is only 17 meters per second. And then a minute and a half later, the updraft has intensified to 45 meters per second. A downdraft has developed out uh, azimuthly upstream of the updraft. Um, and at this time, in this case, the tangential winds have actually decreased substantially um, to um, about 100 meters per second, uh, which is still, of course, very strong. Um, and uh, at this time, you, you still you have this close co-location of the vorticity feature with, with the updraft. So there appears to be a consistent relationship in space and in time between the vorticity, the wind speed, and the vertical velocity. And so that's all consistent with the idea that we have these vortices um, along the inner edge of the eye wall that are, are responsible for creating these extremes in wind speed and updrafts. Um, so this, this, this shows a time series of the uh, vertical velocity on the left and the wind speed on the right following that updraft. So what I showed you in that movie, finding the peak of the updraft. So this shows how it varies from 15 to 30 meters per second over about 20 seconds. It goes up and down, and then you have this intensification uh, increase of vertical velocity of 20 meters per second in a period of only 20 seconds. Um, and over this time period, over this two minutes, the, the, the downdraft intensifies, and you start from very little downdraft to getting a 25 meter per second downdraft. Um, on the right, the black line here is the maximum wind speed that's within 500 meters of the peak updraft. So that's, that's wherever this maximum wind speed is. And starting from about 115, 118 meters per second, um, there's a lot of variation in time. It, it decreases by 15 meters per second over only 20 seconds and increases again and then kind of slowly de uh, starts to decrease with time. Um, but there's a greater than 100 meter per second wind speed associated with this feature for almost two minutes of time. And then finally you get um, the, the, so the blue line is the wind speed at the location of the updraft and then the red line is the minimum wind speed within 500 meters of the updraft. And so at uh, the same time that you have wind speeds of 110 meters per second um, you also have wind speeds as low as 55 meters per second, all within about 500 meters of each other. So that's just associated with that very intense vertical vorticity. So you have um, just an incredible amount of spatial variability in the wind speed. Um, and this is an 118 meter per second wind gust. And like I was showing you, the, these extreme gusts are just extremely unlikely to be sampled observationally. So. Um, I think it's likely that, that gusts of this magnitude exist in real storms, but just that it's just ex it's, it's nearly impossible to sample them. Um, I think I'm getting very close to the end here. Um, and I, I just want to talk a bit about um, what the maximum sampled wind speed in a tropical cyclone is. Um, and. Um, this is similar to uh, the analysis I showed you earlier with the observational signs, um, but explains it a little bit more. Um, this shows um, the horizontal cross section of the tangential wind, uh, sorry, of the 10 meter wind speed, and the black lines here indicate the eye wall region, and the black dots indicate uh, 
where we're dropping drop signs in the simulation. And recall that the actual density of the simulated drop signs is 16 times what's shown here. So it's every 250 meters. And so what I did is I uh, took all the drop signs in the Iowa region, there's about 10,000 of them, um, and I randomly sample combinations of simulated signs in this Iowa region. So I might sample one sign, and I'll pick it there, <coughs> and there, and there, and then just randomly sample it. And, for, and I'll find the maximum wind speed among those signs so if there's one sign, I just take the maximum wind speed from that one sign. If I sample five signs, I find the peak wind speed among all those five signs, and that's a single wind speed. And then I repeat this experiment 10,000 times doing the random sampling to get a distribution of what the peak wind speed that you would expect to find if you sampled with one sign, or with two signs, or with four, or eight, or 16, or 32 signs. So this is the, the distribution of the peak gust sampled by different combinations of random sonds. So for example, for one random sond, you're most likely to find a peak wind of 90 to 95 meters per second in, this, in the simulation. Um, you might find a wind as strong as 110 meters per second, but you might also only find a peak wind of 75 meters per second. So if you just had a single sond in this, and, and imagine this were real, and you drop this one sond, uh, you could easily uh, find a wind um, much weaker than the true maximum wind. And on average, you'd still find a peak wind much weaker than the maximum wind. So like, the, I showed that the peak wind gusts in the simulation are actually 120, 130 meters per second. Um, but typically, you would only find 90 meters per second here. And your chances of sampling something near the maximum are very small. If you instead uh, had two random sons, um, then you're going to increase your expected maximum. Um, you're also going to, um, you're going to narrow your distribution, and it's going to become uh, skewed because you're sampling the maximum. And so um, you for two random signs, you might get 95 to 100 meters per second, most typically. And then for eight random signs, you get 100 to 105 meters per second. So as you add, add more and more signs, you're better able to sample near to the peak. But even for 32 random signs, you're still going, most likely going to find 105 to 110 meters per second. Um, and this is, a, 32 random signs is, is physically plausible but unrealistic. We don't sample with that many signs in the eye wall of the storm. Um, and so even with this unrealistic sampling, we're still substantially underestimating the true peak wind gusts in the tropical cyclone. So the point is that in the simulation, we know that there are these gusts at all times that are much stronger than we've ever observed. But if we sample them in a realistic manner that's similar to how we observe uh, the tropical cyclone, we can't find these peaks. Uh, we're going to underestimate the true maximum. Um, and so uh, I think that's consistent with, um, the, the simulation is consistent with the observations. Um, and so I think it's reasonable that real tropical cyclones have um, wind gusts that are probably substantially stronger than, we, than we've observed and might be 120 to 140 meters per second, similar to what we simulate. So, um, so that's the last point of, of my summary, but I'm also talking, talked about how the observations um, uh, indicate existence of small scale vortices um, that live along the interface of the eye and the eye wall. Um, and these tend to be associated with extreme updrafts on the order of 10 to 30 meters per second at low levels um, and wind speeds of 90 to 110 meters per second in the observations. Um, and large eddy simulations uh, produce what we think are these observed structures. And from the simulations, we can learn more about the dynamics that are very difficult to observe. Um, and like I said, in the simulation, gusts of 120 to 140 meters per second are always present. This is much, well, substantially stronger than what has ever been observed. But I think these gusts are probably realistic because the simulated drop signs very rarely sample gusts greater than 110 meters per second, which is consistent with the observations. Um, and I'll just leave this slide here with some uh, references, and uh, thank you for listening to all of my lectures. Thank you.
Any question or comment? Okay. Yes, please. I'd like to confirm some points. In observations, maximum updraft is often observed above one kilometer. Is yes. Right? Yes. In your LES simulation, mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. the same result? Um, yeah, I have that figure somewhere oh. here. I think. Maybe. Okay, see, this is the height of the wind speeds. Yeah, so this is um, this is the observed distribution of the height of the maximum vertical velocity, and uh, this is the simulated distribution. Um, so I think it, it compares relatively well. Um, uh, there's the uh, there's going to be differences because um, this is a single simulation. I'm releasing them all at 2,500 meters height. The real storms have varying flight levels between two and three and a half kilometers. Um, and so you, you would almost never sample above the flight level unless the sun starts rising rapidly upwards. So you're gonna get a spread in the heights um, there. Um, but, but the main point is that um, you can get um, these updrafts at any height um, below the flight level in both the simulation and in the observation. So they're roughly similar, I think. So in this case, uh, you show the radial location of maximum wind speed distribution in your slide, and uh, there were simulation result. Uh, why do those show the radial location of maximum wind speed? As so um, could you show me some the figure wait, wait. showing? Uh, where is the maximum wind speed located? Yes, radial height cross section. Yes, oh, oh, the azimuthal mean of the. Oh, you, yeah. you want me to go back to no. that figure? Yeah, white dots, white dots show where maximum wind speed is observed. I'm interested in that figure. Yeah. Oh, did I go past it's already. So, no, no. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, so, if you plot where maximum updraft is located. Um, yeah, I have that. I don't, I might have that plot here. I'm not sure. I have it. It's in the paper I submitted. Mm -hmm. Um. And um, the the maximum updrafts are over a much deeper layer, and and so you would um, find them, some of them down here and some of them up here. So you mm -hmm. basically find them like throughout this region. Mm -hmm. um, so similar to the the observ similar to the observations, mm -hmm. how the updrafts are found over a deeper layer. Thank you. Any other question, or comment? Okay. Ah, yes. Could you show again the uh, three-dimensional image for the uh, uh, vertical velocity and the maximum uh, uh, vertical wind speed greater than the 20, uh, 20 meters per second? So uh, in this, uh, in this, this anime, yeah. This one or the other one? Yes, <laughs> that one. animation. So in this uh, uh, animation, the, three, uh, the maximum uh, Greater uh, updraft region is uh, not 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 collocated not with the uh, vortex. Not. Uh, little bit but, yeah, it's a little bit hard to see to see from this. Uh, right as above, yes. not not directly from lower to upper region. Mm -hmm. That is very uh, impressed for me. 
Okay. I got a uh, 20 meter per second area is uh, up, uh, uh, new upward, but like a bubble. bubble. So I don't think it actually moves upward like a bubble. Like mm -hmm. like some there. I think what you're seeing. Well, there might be a little bit rise here, but as some of them decay, you, they might decay from below. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of them actually stay anchored to the low-level feature. Um, and I have, um, I have a, I think I have an animation that, that might show that more clearly somewhere here. So this is from a, a coarser um, 125 meters simulation, um, and so this is this is height zero to three kilometers, and then on the x-axis is the azimuth. So um, this is following an updraft, um, and that's what's colored here. And so this updraft that we're tracking stays at the same height for for this six-minute period. Um, and it, it's sh generally shallow, confined to the lowest kilometer half, and it doesn't go go up or down much. Um, and then the downdraft forms just upstream of it there to the left. And here again is where you see um, the vorticity is in white, and 100 meter per second is in red here. And the, so the the, the peak wind speed is some is both upstream and below the, the peak vertical velocity in this case. So yeah, I I, I think actually these. They generally don't rise up like bubbles. They kind of, um, when they exist, they just kind of stay there in this in the same height. In this figure, in this figure, I think that that the updraft region has a loop, same same loop, has a lower than layer. So I will I will consider more in my in my mind. Okay. Thank you very much. So, so, so this upward motion doesn't couple with the convection. Uh, um, I mean, it might couple in the sense that, like, like parcels from there could end up eventually rising in other updrafts, but it, it doesn't appear like this is part of. A, it's not directly connected to a deep updraft. Yeah, yeah. These are shallow features of the low levels. Um, I think driven by sheer instabilities. Um, yeah. they're, they're not um, they're not buoyant so they need to come from some dynamic instability um, I think I may So this is an example of, of another updraft in the course simulation, in the 125 meter simulation, and and um, the cross sections here show the buoyant acceleration in, in meters per second squared, and it's it's pretty small, and it's actually negative where the updraft is, so the, it's actually slightly negatively buoyant here. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas the dynamic acceleration is two orders of magnitude larger, so this is yeah. two meters per second squared, and so it's it's all um, uh, dynamic acceleration um, uh, that's responsible for the, the vertical motion here. Okay, so Ono san, uh, yeah, okay. uh, same, same comment. Okay, any other comment? Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, Dan san, for a very exciting topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the seminar is finished, and then we'll have a uh, break. And uh, next. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, yes, yes. And uh, what time we will we will start the presentation for the Japanese participants? So three fifteen. Oh, fifteen. Okay, fifteen. Minutes. Fifteen. Okay. So fifteen minutes later, we will start. Okay.